I'm uh, Terry Salmonson, for those that don't know and those that don't care. I'm still Terry Salmonson. And uh, we're going to get the weekend kicked off with this first presentation. And hopefully you guys will enjoy it. Was anybody here last year? Well, we've got to build an audience maybe for year three. We're planning on year three right now. Last year, as you, uh, for those of you that attended uh, my presentation, it was on the Green Hornet. This year, it's going to be on the Lone Ranger. And uh, if any of you that took issue with a few things I said during the presentation last year, we now have uncovered certain facts on the Green Hornet. I'm more than glad to talk to you at the table or any time during the weekend uh, to clear up any loose ends points like that. Was he Japanese or was he Filipino? <laughs> okay, uh, the purpose of this get-together is a Lone Ranger on radio. Uh, I've covered uh, most of the uh, program from uh, A to Z, as it may be, on radio, screen, television, books, comics, you know, the whole nine yards. But my talk here today will be just on the radio and to hopefully clear up a few misconceptions and to set the record straight on a few areas. Again, urban legend keeps creeping in on some facts occasionally, and uh, um, I won't use the word plagiarism, but there's been a, a number of things that have been printed over the years that were incorrect and the same almost to the punctuation and, and uh, comma is reprinted again and again and again. Once it appears in print, it becomes the gospel, and it's mighty hard to stop. Uh, wrong information from being continued to be disseminated, especially with the age of the internet nowadays. The uh, Lone Ranger for, uh, and including the Lone Ranger owners that keep propelling the same information that they have in their files, have always claimed the first broadcast was on January 30th, 1933, which is totally incorrect. There may have been, and I want to use the word very heavily, may, I don't think it, it happened, but there may have been a possible test broadcast several weeks before. But I, I doubt it based on a variety of reasons, one of which I'll give you, and that is the WXYZ was one of the few non-East or West Coast communities outside of Chicago, that is, that did original productions. And they were extremely a very successful station. They had a very packed schedule. For, that, for them to bump something that was a good money maker, to try out a test broadcast or two of a, a possibility uh, of an idea that they think might work, uh, and based on the uh, guiding hand of Mr. Trumbull, uh, would have been almost an impossible situation to just arbitrarily throw it a show on. The show's first broadcast that I've been able to document, and as far as I'm concerned, it is the first broadcast, it was on January 31st, 1933. Now, for all of you that will run off to your 200-year calendars and will come January of the year 1933, you'll see the 31st on a Tuesday, and obviously Simonson's got to be wrong because it was a Monday, Wednesday, Friday show. It was a Monday, Wednesday, Friday show after November of 1933. From uh, January 31st, 1933, all the way up until um, November 29th of 1933, it was a Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday show at 8 o'clock. One of the reasons that it, it, it would never have gone on Monday, Wednesday, Friday was WXYZ had several shows that were absolute hit, bona fide money makers, and they weren't going to move the schedule around for that. Uh, well, one of them was Manhunters and, and a number of other shows that they were producing locally there. And... Um, so they had slots open on Tuesday, Thursdays, and Saturdays, and that's where the show stayed until the uh, uh, broadcast when they changed uh, on uh, uh, November 29th. And that's when it went over to Saturday, or Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And then also with a, uh, a sponsor called the Gordon Baking Company for Silver Cup Bread. Now, Silver Cup is always remembered as the sponsor, but in reality, it wasn't Silver Cup. They stayed for about two years. But for some particular reason, everybody remembers Silver Cup for all the sponsorship for over the years, and that was not. I'll get to some of the other sponsors a little bit later. First premium. For the listeners, if they wrote in, the possibility of getting one of 300 six-year pistols. 
just like the Long Range Express. And uh, they weren't, uh, they, they didn't know how well the show was doing and what kind of an audience rating they had at that point. This was, after all, only show number 46. And uh, they had uh, a slight uh, a difference of potential on what we had to give away versus what's requested. And in the, one of the WXYZ newsletters that I have, they reported that they received 24,905 requests for these 300 guns that they had to give away. So they knew right then they had a hit show. This was also the first broadcast of a, a longtime actor that would fill the role of the Long Ranger. Uh, digressing a little bit here, uh, the show started with uh, a, a man by the name of George Stinius, who was the first Long Ranger. Uh, and he was the Lone Ranger for the first 43 shows. He later went on to, uh, and one of the reasons he, he left the role was he went off to Hollywood, changed his name, and became George Seaton, who was a very lucrative, very uh, respected and uh, good director out there. They went through a couple of different uh, Lone Rangers uh, very quickly, in quick succession. Jack Deeds on May 11th, 1933, whose uh, real name was uh, Lee Trent, uh, posed uh, the uh, role as the Long Ranger. He was, a, at the time, a student at Wayne State, along with some of the other actors that were at WXYZ. And uh, they thought Deeds would make a good Long Ranger. He had, certainly had the voice range and everything. But in those days, they did three broadcasts a night, once for the East Coast, one for the Midwest, and one for via telephone lines for the uh, West Coast. Um, and there was a break between the second and third show. And a lot of the actors would go down to a place called uh, the Alcove, which was a local watering hole. They'd have dinner. Some of them would do a little libation going. And Deeds was so intimidated by Jim Jules, the director, who was a pretty heavy handed director, that he uh, had a little more than, than he needed to be drinking. And uh, by the time they got, he made it through the, the night, when he showed up the, uh, for the next broadcast day, two days later, uh, they said there was no way this guy was going to handle it because he was already smashed when he walked in from that link, knowing what he was going to be expecting to see. So uh, uh, Jules himself stepped into the role for one broadcast on uh, May 13th, 1933. And uh, after that, they replaced uh, him with a man by the name of uh, Raja. And Raja, of course, stayed in the role until he was killed April 8th, 1941. Uh, the first Tonto appearance was on script number uh, 12. Uh, for the first uh, few uh, weeks, the Lone Ranger mostly talked a lot about it. It was horse a to let the audience know what the action was going on. And they figured they couldn't have him continuing to talk to his horse. <laughs> so they brought in the character of Tonto. Um, Roger. Like I said, he, he did 1,234 shows before he was killed in an automobile accident. He uh, basically fell asleep in the wheel of a car on the way home from the party. He was not going to sleep. And uh, ran into the back end of a parked truck on Grand River in Farmington, uh, Michigan. Uh, pardon me? Uh, and it was, he was probably only, uh, I don't think he was more than three miles from my house. Um, and his home, I lived about four miles from where the Roger Holm uh, is and, and still is today. Uh, it served for many years as a bed and breakfast, and people would find it rather neat. I got to sleep in the Long Ranger's home, where it's no longer a bed and breakfast now. Is there any plaques? There is a, the, the community put a flag up about four years ago, five years ago, and uh, it's, it's privately owned now, and uh, the owners allowed me about uh, six years ago to go through and, and extensively uh, uh, digitally film the entire uh, house including some of the original timbers uh, that were used as foundations for the house that was built in the early uh, 1800s. So um, uh, it's very interesting to see, and of course, uh, 